Welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg. Um, I hope I hope you had a chance to talk with each other. I see there's actually a couple people who have your hands up uh, right now. Um, and after I bring Zach up, then I'll come down. I hope um, I I hope you're all hearing me because Zach was saying he had some some uh, issues before. Let me just go after um, one other thing. And that is next week we have another EdChat interactive session with Anne Francis. Um, that's going to be on how you can use games uh, with a class in order to make it a more inclusive and diverse class. So it can actually be um, tailored, or you can assign games to different people, or have different people do diff different students do different things with the games depending on their capabilities. I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation with Anne Francis. So I'd like to encourage you, if you're interested in games or you're, you're interested in diversity, um, to sign up for that event next week. It's our last event before Thanksgiving. And now, for our speaker, I'd like to bring up Zachary Walker. Hello, hello. What part of the United States are you, are you coming from? Are you uh, broadcasting from? Zach? I'm actually not in the U.S. right now. Aha! I know, I know. That's why. Yeah, I, I'm uh, actually in Singapore right now. Um, I was born in Kansas and moved around quite a lot, so I've been in quite a few places. And um, but I've been in Singapore for about the last two and a half years. I still am lucky to have a lot of a lot of work back in the U.S. So I work with schools and districts, and obviously I still have parents in the U.S. And uh, but yeah, I'm over in Singapore now. So it is 9 a.m. Uh, Friday morning. So. You all are actually in the future at this very moment, which is kind of cool. Um, we're going to go ahead and get moving here. I think um, in a second, Mitch is going to bring up some slides, and uh, they're coming right now. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and then um, hopefully this will all go smoothly. Um, but the first thing is uh, thank you for being here, obviously. Um, I appreciate you all being here. I um, am a teacher by trade and I still consider myself a teacher and um, I'll tell my story here in a minute but if you have any inform if you want my contact information there you go um, thankfully Mitch um, has to move all the slides from his side so I'll, you'll hear me say next slide quite often and that's what I'm going to say right now next slide um, and I do just want to thank you all for being here because I know that you know there are lots of things to do on a on a Thursday evening Wherever you are, I know that we've got some people that I think are joining from India, from Greece, from Australia. So whatever time it is, thank you for being here. Um, as we keep moving, um, I want to start with um, a couple of, of disclaimers. Everything that, that I talk about today is going to be kind of grounded in pedagogy. Um, and uh, the tools that we're going to talk about are free. I think sometimes we make technology too difficult. Um, and I am not a techie, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But one of the things that we have to do is start with what we know. And so we'll share um, some starter ideas today, and then it's obviously up to us as teachers to go back and be creative with those ideas and, 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 um, and take those forward. One of the things that I'm really big on, though, is that we're going to cover every slide if we don't have time for it. We'll do what we can, and what we don't get to, if we need to have another one, um, we can do that. I think one of the things that we do in education sometimes is we cover a lot of content, but we oftentimes forget that students have to learn the content. And I think that's a pretty dangerous thing for us to do. So we'll, we'll do what we can, and hopefully you can take away some things. And then if we need to follow up, if we need to have another one of these, or if you want to reach out to me privately, please feel free to do that. Um, if you have a phone, which I, I know the statistics, so I know that 8% of you do in the U.S., uh, if you have a, a mobile phone there, um, a smartphone, go ahead and pull that out. You will need that for a couple things that we're going to do. And please understand that the link to all the slides will be provided at the end. So if you miss something, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You will have a chance to get all those slides at the end. So um, next slide, please. Um, what I want to tell you about is how I got into technology because I think it's important. And I'm going to ask you in a second to think about why you're into technology and why you use it for teaching. I was a secondary teacher my first uh, three years, and I never used technology at all. I was uh, tell funny stories and make it engaging. I didn't even use PowerPoints. Um, and this student right here, Kareem, changed kind of the way that I looked at everything. Kareem was from Lebanon, and um, he was a senior in high school, 
and spoke four languages, 3.8 GPA, brilliant young man. Um, and his senior year of high school, he had already been accepted to some universities in the US. His senior year of high school, he was hit by a drunk driver and he, he um, suffered from a traumatic brain injury. And he was in a coma for six months, and then six months after that, he was in rehab. And when he ended up coming to the school that I was at at the time, he said, you know, I want to learn. I don't, I, you know, this is my story, and, and I don't have any short-term memory at all. And that was one of the ways that his TBI had affected him. So he came to me, and, and I said, Kareem, I said, I want to help you. Um, I don't know how to help you, though. And he said, well, he said, you know, if you'll let me take pictures of all the notes that you write, that will really help me. Because the other thing is, besides the short-term memory, I have a real hard time with motor skill coordination. Um, and he said, so I can write, but I just don't write very fast. And he said, if you can, if you can allow me to take pictures, that will really help. And I said, Kareem, that's fine, no problem at all. And he said, and and it, the other thing is, he said, um, this is I think key because I know we have some questions on executive functioning skills and students who. Uh, work with students with special needs is he said, if you can give me all the assignments in the syllabus now, I'll go ahead and put all those in my phone and I will actually put them in my calendar and I'll set up reminders for myself. And I said, great, here's everything, you know, that that you'll need or, or the most part, but I'll also make sure that I remind you if there's anything special coming up and we'll put it in your phone together. And he said, and the, the third thing is he said, if you don't mind, I'm just going to video my walk around school. He said, because sometimes I get lost um, pretty easily. So he, he actually, the before school even started, came in and we videoed his walk from class to class. And then he went back and watched that. And for me, working with Kareem, um, that was the moment for me that the light bulb came on. And I said, you know, I would never take a wheelchair away from a kid, but I'm every day, some of these kids can rely on their devices and they come into class and I'm not allowing them to do that. Or, I'm not even using visuals in class. I'm not even using technology. And so that really is where I became interested in technology. Um, and, and so Kareem really changed my life um, as a student of mine. And, and I know that we all have stories like that. But if we can keep going, um, Mitch, what I'd um, like the other thing is beyond Kareem, I just looked around. And you know, if you look around you, you see people on their phones all the time. And this is a survey that came out last year that said that college freshmen um, are more likely to do their coursework on their phone than on their desktop. And I know for some of us that's really, really hard to believe. Um, but it's true, and if you spend any time on a college campus at all, you'll see that, that a lot of students now, they're writing papers on their phone, they're doing their assessments on their phone. And I thought, you know, as a teacher, I need to prepare them for that environment where we literally do everything on our phone. And I think our job as teachers is, that, you know, the first day should be exactly like the last day inside school. And so if I'm not preparing them for the first day out of school when they're in my class, I'm not doing a good job. That's that's on me. And so I realized not only did I want to help students like Kareem who needed technology just for accessibility, but I also thought just for every single student out there who's entering a world where devices are everywhere and yet the one place that we tell them to put their devices away is often in school. And that seems a little um, counterintuitive to me. So. That's why I started using technology probably 10 years ago. And um, it's kind of taken off from there, obviously, with, with the advent of other things. And, and so we're going to talk about those in a second. But if we can keep moving, what I'd like you to do real quick is find a partner, partner up, and you have one minute there, OK? And, and we'll take one minute to do this. Uh, what's your name? Where are you from? What's your current role? And then in one minute, why technology for you? So it's one minute per person. Find a partner. And go. Now, one of the things that I could be doing is I could be joining each of your conversations. I hope that um, everyone is able to be talking with someone. I see some of you are partnered up, and some of you are even laughing, so that's good. You picked funny people, and that's always really important. Um, and some of you are by yourself. Ariel, I, I feel bad for you. Someone, be Ariel's friend, somebody. Join Ariel. Let her, be, let her have a friend, too. Um, so anyway, we're going to keep moving because I, I do want to keep moving and I want to get through some of these other things, but I'm glad that everyone has, has, found, um, has found a partner. So what we're actually going to start with today, questions. Now, when you signed up, you may not remember this, but you had the opportunity to ask some questions. And one of the things about professional development is that we have a lot of professional developers, and I'm one too, so please, I'm not, I'm not being harsh here. 
but they come in and they do the same thing and maybe that's not always applicable to the audience. So we're actually going to start with some of those questions. I'm going to spend five or ten minutes going through some of the questions asked and then we'll just talk about five simple tools. Again, we may not have time to get to all five of them and that's okay. If we need to, we can do another uh, another webinar. You can reach out to me privately, but um, we're going to start with the questions. So as we keep going here, I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide, please, Mitch, if you don't mind. I want you to, um, I want you to remember this one thing. Um, while one person hesitates because he feels inferior, another is making mistakes and becoming superior. So one of the things that I may ask you to do while we're going through some of these questions is actually act out some things with me. And um, I would appreciate it is if you would actually do those. Uh, it may make you feel silly. Some of you are at home by yourself and your dogs might start barking at you. That's okay, right? Um, let's, let's just go with it and, uh, and, and we'll figure out how it works as we go. So uh, next slide, please. Um, as I go through, you're going to see some of these um, questions here. So Cheryl, you had asked about executive functioning and, um, for students with disabilities. And, and again, I'm going to answer these and I hope everyone can take something from these answers. Um, one of the best things we can do to help our students with executive functioning is we don't even need to download a bunch of apps or anything like that. If we allow kids to use their phones and we make the best use possible of their calendar, if we teach them how to set up reminders, if we allow them to put everything in their devices before we even get started teaching, that can be very, very, very helpful. And I think one thing that we do is, you know, things like um, voice memos. I have a lot of students, because I work with students with disabilities as well, I have a lot of students who find voice memos incredibly helpful. Maybe they have dysgraphia and they can't write, or um, dyscalculia and they can't remember things, or, or like Kareem had short-term memory. He would say all of his homework as a voice memo, so we could go back and listen to it later. So a quick answer to that, Cheryl, and again, we can continue this conversation later, is really help your students understand every, every native feature that's on their device. That can be critically, critically important. Uh, Devin, you had asked about elementary classroom, um, specifically, I believe, um, looking at like writing strategies and things like that. Um, one of the things that I encourage a classroom teacher to do is every student should have a blog. We're going to talk a little bit about blogs later, but every student should have a blog. You can set them up and make them private, and this is incredibly, incredibly critical. And we'll again, we'll get into blogs a little bit later. But the other thing I always tell elementary school and primary school teachers and schools that I work with is there's three things that, in my estimation, every every primary school should be doing. Every student should have a blog. Every class should focus on how to search, how to search effectively, how to search efficiently, and, and search engines. Because if you can teach a student to search, that is the new literacy. I'm going to say it again. If you can teach a, search, a child to search, that is the new literacy. So we need to start in first and second grade showing them sites like Safe Search, which only allow um, search engines that have been reviewed by librarians and teachers. We need to show them things like Instagram, which is a visual map. It's not just Google. So there's lots of ways to search, and we need to really focus on those things. And then obviously the third one, which we talk a lot about, but I find that a lot of schools um, aren't, aren't spending quality time on is digital citizenship. And obviously we need to start those at the primary school level. So I think those are the three things that I always talk about with elementary school classrooms. Again, I'm going to later if we have time but I think we need to really focus on those. Uh, Cynthia, you asked about history and social studies. Uh, I'll just say tools and resources are coming up. At the end, I'm gonna give you a few links to go to some places specifically for uh, history and social studies, but for every content area. Beth, um, you had asked about PD for staff. Uh, one of the things that, that I always say, you know, it's, it's been out there um, and attributed to others as well, is that you know technology is a mindset, it's not a skill set. And it's hard to change mindsets, right? Skill sets, I can do direct, you know, direct instruction and kind of say, okay, this is step A, this is step B, this is step C. It's necessary from time to time, but we have to really look at changing mindsets. And so one of the things, there's three basic ways that, that I think in the schools that I work with, you can, you can help this. And I'll go through these very quickly. Number one, show them the statistics of students in the world, students using devices, and show them the reality of today. And there are lots of ways to do this. There are lots of videos that look at the reality of today's workplace. There are lots of videos that look at the reality of today's schools, but we have to show them 
the reality of today and the statistics oftentimes, especially for our cerebral faculty who need to be proven things, this can be really helpful. Second thing is show them work examples. Show them work examples of what they can do using technology. So that teacher who is a non-traditional who wants her students to write a 500 word essay, say, okay, here's a 500 word essay, here's a vlog, which has video, which has pictures, which has text, which has images, which has all these other things, and which one is more relevant in today's world? Because if we go back to just good evidence-based practice, we know that things have to be relevant, they have to be rigorous, and we have to have a relationship with them. So when we talk about relevance, a 500 word essay, while important, and certainly a place for that, I'm not downplaying that at all, there are multiple ways we can also allow students to show their learning. So if we can show our faculty that, I think that's important in our staff. The third thing is, and this is true in a lot of school systems, you might have to bring in someone from the outside that can kick their tail a little bit, right? Who can say things that you can't say, because you work with them every day, right? You want to keep the peace in some ways, so it's important that you maybe bring someone else who can challenge them a little bit. And, and I always, the phrase I always use is challenge them with a hug, right? I want to challenge them. I want them to know that, you know, I'm supporting you, but you've got, you know, we've got to change. We've got to move forward. And so I think that's really important. Real quick, just to do a little check in, everyone thumbs up if you're still with me. If you've fallen asleep or you're not here anymore, that's okay too. Um, but just give me a little quick thumbs up if any of those points stuck out to you that I've gone through so far. All right, everybody good? Okay, so thumbs aren't working, but that's okay, right? That's all right, it's fine, no problem. Um, I appreciate you being here anyway. All right, so um, Eric. Um, Eric had asked about the gap between teacher understanding with technology and student understanding with technology. And one of the things that I, I'm just gonna say real quick on this, and this is something that every teacher should do, whether you're talking about technology or whether you're talking about and this is an age-old strategy that, that sometimes we don't do. The three before me. So in all of my classes, my students have to ask three other people before they come and ask me a question. And I explain to them, this is not because I don't want to help you. This is not because I don't want to answer your question. But what it does is it creates an actual community of learners. So they're relying on each other for knowledge and not just on me. And this is especially helpful when we talk about technology. Because if I can get them to troubleshoot their own problems, what happens then is they understand that, hey, he's got knowledge and she's got knowledge and she's really good with that. And what that does is that makes them then not just rely on me and my funds of knowledge. I don't know if you're familiar with that terminology, funds of knowledge. We all have different funds of knowledge. All of you in the audience have funds of knowledge. But if you just rely on the teacher, traditionally the teacher has been like the ATM, right? just giving out knowledge. Well, we have to get away from that model because we all have funds of knowledge and we have Google who has a lot of knowledge, right? So I have all the students, they always have to ask three, three other people before they come to me. Now here's the critical thing about this. When they come to me and ask a question, the first thing I say is ask. If they did ask three other people, what does that mean? That means that I probably need to cover something in, right? So it's also a good self check with me because now I know, hey, you know what? At least four people in my class didn't understand this. I've got to make sure that I'm recovering it, going over it again, et cetera. And I think this is really, really critical. And so I do this with technology because this also helps teachers close that gap because they see students troubleshooting themselves. So then again, if they do come to the teacher, then we figure it out together as a class. But it creates a collective community of knowledge, not just me giving out knowledge all the time. And I think that's critical. Um, okay. Uh, Jennifer asked a question about how do we get from teacher-led classrooms to learning-led classrooms. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I did just write a, um, a blog for Ed Week, um, Peter DeWitt's um, blog that came out a couple of weeks ago on um, how, how, to, how to help your students learn more is to do less. So you're welcome to check that out. If you want that link, um, email me and I'll send that and you that link later. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Real quick in the chat room, please. Put in one thing that you just thought about. One thing that you just thought about um, on, on all the slides there. And I think, uh, Mitch, I think we skipped a slide too real quick. So in the chat room, go to the my room and in the chat, 
there. I know Tom has written a couple of things. Thank you, Tom. Um, everyone else just put something. Yeah, go back one more, Mitch. To uh, the name at the top, I believe, should be Shakira. Yep, Shakira's. Next one. Oh, no, keep going. <laughs> one more slide. Right there. Nope. Man, it keeps going through, doesn't it? Um, is everybody putting something in the chat room? We got people writing. Oh, there, uh, thanks for whoever put the link up. Thank you. So I'll just um, say that. So for, there's the link to that right there. For those of you uh, who don't um, know how to good. put it. Good. So we've got some people putting some things up there. So for those who don't know how to get to the chat room, if you move your cursor and hover over your avatar, you see that one of the uh, um, icons there is IM. If you click on that IM, you'll get a chat up there. And then when you put answers in, you'll put the answers in, they'll, uh, they'll appear so we, everybody in your room can see them. Um, and, uh, and, and that way, Zachary, you can see them. Let me pull myself down, and I'll, and I'll get the slides back up. And I see there's there a question we go. as well. Perfect. Perfect. So we've got some people. Thank you, Cheryl, Tracy. We've got some people putting stuff in there. Um, and this is, again, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the back channel discussion. Patty, I'm getting to your question in a minute. Um, we're seeing that what we have right now is a back channel discussion going on, right? And this is incredibly critical as well. I'm not going to get to that today, but what you can see in that IM chat is, is we actually have a, a, a back channel discussion going, which is, which is really important. Okay. So I'm going to get to some of these other, um, some of these other concerns real quick or, or questions that you had beforehand. Um, if we go back to Shakira had asked about evidence-based practices. Um, now here's the thing about technology, right? And, and um, I feel pretty passionate about this one because I, you know, we're all teachers first. We're not technologists. We're all teachers first. And what we have to think about is what do we already do in the classroom? So we do things like gather interest. We do things like have discussions. We do things like formative assessment. We do things like summative assessment. So what we have to do is take the evidence in those areas and then just adapt technology to do it. Right? So. I, if, if you can make a list of the things that you do in classroom every day and then think, okay, how can I use photos for that? How could I use video for that? How could I use polling for that? Those are what we have to do. I could give a week-long conversation on that. I would love to have a, a conversation with all of you on this. But, um, yes, and we'll talk about blogs here in a second. Um, I got that, that question popped up. But the thing is, with we have to really think about what are the evidence-based practices we know exist, right? So we know active learning is really important. So how can we use technology to make them more active? One of the ways you're doing it right now is we're having a back channel discussion. So if I continue to ask you things using in this webinar format and you can have a back channel discussion, what that does for a lot of students, that gives every single one of them a voice. That quiet little 13-year-old girl in the back of the room who doesn't say much, if you have her participate in a back channel discussion, all of a sudden she has a voice. And that's really, really powerful for our students. So again, we have to think about what are the things that we already do? What do we already know works with evidence? And we use technology to do those. Absolutely. So we have um, Iris, um, elementary writing, blogs. Again, I've talked about those. One of my favorite strategies, I, I don't know, I love this strategy. Um, use word clouds, right? And so one of the ways that you can help students with their writing and do interactive writing is if they have to write a 100-word essay or a 500-word essay or whatever it may be, have them put their own essay in a word cloud. And if you're not familiar with what word clouds do, word clouds will pop up the biggest words and the words that are most used. So then they use that as a little bit of a self-analysis to see what words they're using the most. For example, with younger children, the word I all the time when they write, right? Because their vocabulary is not as big, but it also allows them to really see, oh, I'm using this word a lot. Or if it's about a specific topic, how many times are they actually mentioning that topic? So there's all kinds of things we can do with writing using word clouds. And again, talked about back channel discussions. One of the exercises that I sometimes do in professional developments is I will start a back channel discussion with a sentence. 
And every participant in order has to add on to that sentence. So then what you do, the classroom creates a story. And that is amazing. That's a really amazing strategy to create, again, community writing. Okay, moving on. Um, Donald, you asked about transitioning to technology. Um, I think the first thing that I would always say is, when we look at money and we look at costs is make sure you try to go with the BYOD policy. We can, um, we can discuss this more. I'm happy to talk with you and set up a phone call. I can give you a call if you'd like to talk about this more. But um, when it comes to finances, the best thing to do is BYOD. So I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Okay. Um, and again, I know I'm going fairly quickly on these. Um, Antoinette, management and I hope you all are ready to play. Everybody ready? Give me a nod if you're ready to play. Just bounce your head up and down a little bit. Please? Someone? Yes? Okay. So, classroom management tips. Here's our classroom management tips. Um, I'm just going to go through three of them, but I'm going to ask you to actually do what I'm doing. So, grab your device. If you have a device with you, grab it, hold it in front of you, act like you're texting, I don't know, send it, take Instagram, tweet something out, whatever you want to do. All right. So, you're on this in class because I want you on your device because I want you searching about something. When I count to three, I'm going to ask you to actually do something with your device, and I just want you to follow it. Okay. So, you're on your device, you're working. One, two, three, dock your device. That means face down right in the top right-hand corner of your learning space. All right, so you're going to put your, hand, your device face down, top right-hand corner of your learning space. Now, this is what we call docking your device, okay? And this is a, a, a way to help manage students with their devices because now it's face down, but you can see it. Because what happens if I were to tell you, even if I'm in a live environment, put your device away, it's under your desk and you're still texting people, right? You're still playing Angry Birds in your pocket because that's what our students are capable of. So we place on the desks where students have to put their devices when they're not used and that we can see those devices. That's critical, all right? So dock your device is the first strategy and I think that's a really important one. Um, second one, everybody pick your device up again. Please pick your device up again. Grab it. Act like you're using it again. All right, so now you're on your device. I'm having you write on your device. And this, this could be a phone. It could be an, a tablet, whatever. Okay, you're on your device. One, two, three, hands up. Quick, hands up. Quick, quick, quick. See, now what I could do if I was in a real classroom, I can walk you what Don was actually doing on his device. I can walk around and see what Ariel was shopping for. I can walk around and see if Kara was checking sports scores, right? So what I do is I have hands up, right? And now I do a quick lap around class, which gets me out amongst my students, which is critical, right? So the second one, hands up. First one, dock your device. Second one, hands up. Again, I am not trying to get anyone in trouble, but I am also trying to manage the class. If I do a hands up strategy, they put their device down, they have their hands up. I walk around real quick, boom, I'm right back to teaching, right? So that's the second one. Last one, we're only one grab your devices again you're on your device everybody on their device you're on your device last one one two three show me your screen show me your screen all right so this is another strategy that you can use in class if you remember if you've been teaching for a while like some of us you were old whiteboards where you would write whiteboards and they would show you their answer to you right so this is the same thing. You can have them use a whiteboard app. So they're doing work on there, and now they can actually hold that up, and you can see what they're doing. Again, not as a punitive measure. It's also a classroom management strategy, but it can also be a formative assessment. So they're doing something. You say, show me your screen. Boom. They show it to you. You can do a quick check. Okay, so everyone seems to be on the right track. and Go right back to teaching. So those are three simple ways to help start managing the class. I have about eight tips um, that I use a lot, but we're just going to go through three for now because those three, if used effectively and you train your kids on them, can be highly, highly helpful in class. Um, okay, let's see. Anything else on the questions that I need to get to? Um, I think that's it. Um, we can go to the next slide, please, Mitch. One of the things that um, I think is important when we talk about professional development is, is this. If you make people think they're thinking, they'll love you. 
if you really make them think they'll hate you. And we find this sometimes in professional development, right? Especially I know that we've got some on here who are IT directors and administrators. Um, and I think we just have to kind of keep this in mind that it's sometimes going to be hard when you press some people. So um, keep that in mind as you're working with colleagues, as you're training. That, um, you know, want them to love us, want them to think they're thinking, but it's also important that we really make think just like with our students. Sometimes things that we can do, even though students say they want freedom and creativity, is to give it to them because then they don't know what to do with it because they're not used to living in that environment. So it is going to be hard sometimes when you do some of these um, activities with your students. Okay, let's move forward. Um, we are going to keep rocking and rolling here. Um, what I'd like you to do real quick is actually, instead of going to the chat box, find someone, find a friend, one minute. Um, some of you are already in groups. Find a friend, one minute, and uh, one quick question, takeaway, idea so far. Okay, one quick question, takeaway, idea so far. All right, so find a friend and, uh, and figure something out. All right, I hope everybody is uh, ready to rock and roll again. We're going to keep moving. Now, we've only got about 10 or 15 minutes left. So, um, Actually, we're going to skip past this. Let's go um, to photos. I'm just going to do one quick thing on photos, and then we'll kind of come back and tie it all together. Uh, again, if you're interested more in, in polling or videos or some of these other things, um, I can certainly do another one of these, or you can reach out to me individually, um, and I'm happy to speak with all of you about this. Um, but I wanted to make sure the questions, because again, we talk about differentiated instruction a lot, and we talk about um, you know, monitoring instruction, you know, and, and, and differentiating learning for our students. But one of the things that is um, most interesting to me is that oftentimes our professional development isn't differentiated. And so that is, um, that's a concern. How, you know, we should be modeling what we're preaching, right? So, um, all right, let's, let's do the photos. Um, real quick now, again, I'm going to ask you to do something that may feel uncomfortable for you, but you're going to get one minute to do this. Take a photo in the space that you are in right now and tell me how that relates to class. So the space that you're in right now, grab your phone, take a photo of something in that space. Something in that space and how does it relate to something that you could teach in class. All right, and if you're an administrator, something you could teach your faculty, um, something. But it's got to it's relate to some concept that you teach in class. You've got about 45 seconds left. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to go back to the chat box. All right, so go back to the chat box, and what did you take a photo of and why? What did you take a photo of and why? All right, so let's jot that down in the room chat box, okay? So go ahead and put in the chat box, all right, one you took a photo of and why. All right, Kara took a photo of dogs to work on behavior modification. Fantastic. Others? No, no one else likes to take photos. Which, by the way, just on the side note, selfies, so, number one country in the world to take selfies. So uh -oh. uh, so just wanted you, you to note that there's uh, there are a bunch of people in room two, and my extra computer is in room two, and there's a bunch of us who took pictures of sloppy desks in order to teach organization. Ah. Uh. Not, not sloppy. You just can't see it from the from the video. So I'll put I'll put the slide back up. But I just thought I'd let you know about room two. Okay. Sorry about y'all. Room two. I can't get over there. That's one of the things that um is is one of the things they're working out on this platform. But here's the thing about this, and this is why this is really 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 important, right? Every single thing that we teach in the classroom, our students should have to take a picture of something in their community that relates to that. This is critical, again, for establishing relevance, because if you're teaching anything that you teach and a student has to go out into their and take a picture of a concept that relates to that, this is three things. First of all, relevance, because now what you're teaching makes sense because they see it in their community. Number two, what happens is now every time they see that, what are they reminded of? Your class and your content. Right? And this is critical. 
Number three, what it does is it gives them ownership over the content. So instead of you're taking, you know, you're teaching biology and you're taking pictures of plants, right? Now they own those plants because of a picture of it. That's a much different experience than them opening a textbook and seeing a photo that was taken eight states away in a, in a place that they've never been. So every, the way that we want to use photos is we want them to be taking photos of everything and then relating them back to our content. And I love Ariel, I love your, um, your idea, taking a photo of a character. So one of the things that we can do is, for example, if you teach um, literature or you teach language arts, even at this level, as you know, young students are reading books, have them pick someone they know who reminds them of that character. Right? So if they're reading, I don't know, Lord of the Fly, or they're reading something like that, they have to take a picture of a family member, a friend, whatever, who reminds them of that character. And it ties them back to that content. Right? So again, everyone knows how to use photos. Our students do it all the time. We take them all the time. It's being creative with what we know. And that's critical because everything that we teach can relate somewhere in our lives, but we have to help the students make those connections. Okay, okay. let's go to the next slide real quick. Um, so here's some, some simple ways to use photos in class. Um, story prompts. Oftentimes when we're trying to get students to write, we give them out a prompt. We maybe start a sentence. And the problem with that is that it's, it's one prompt for every single student. And sometimes we want to direct their writing, but other times, we just want them to write. So give them six photos and let them pick which one they want to write about. What's that photo remind you of? Tell me the story behind that photo. What happened directly after the photo was taken? What happened directly before the photo was taken? How many adjectives can you use to describe that photo? How many colors do you see? Right? So we can talk about all those things as a story prompt by using photos. Um, some of the best math teachers that I work with have geometric scavenger hunts in the community. So every that they talk about in class, their students have to go find that shape in their community. And this is actually, again, these are actual assignments they get points for. So when we talk about things like, um, you know, not using textbooks in the future and things like that, all these things we can still relate back to class by using simple tools like photos. Obviously, if you teach world languages, there's lots of different ways. Um, I'd like you to think real quick, though, how would you take a photo of irony? So this is another thing that we can do with photos. Take pictures of concepts. Because when we think about concepts, a student can write the definition of a concept. They may be even able to use it in a sentence. But if I can take a photo of something like irony, that makes me help me understand that I really get it. I really understand it. And that is critical, right? So lots of things we can do with photos. The last one is, um, real quick, uh, just by show of hands, all right, so just, just not a virtual hand, a real hand. Um, just by show of hands, how many of you ever see errors in your communities? Spelling errors, grammar errors, math errors, any of those kinds of things. Raise your hand real quick. Just, just show me if you see them, right? So our students picture these all the time, right? And it should be worth points. So on my syllabus, one of the things that's on my syllabi is that you have to find five community errors throughout the semester. But you cannot find any error that anyone else has found. So they upload them to our learning management system, our LMS, and then they have to look through and they see all the errors that have been made. And then there's a couple things this does, right? Number one, again, makes them see what happens in their community right which is really critical it makes them think outside of class it actually gets their eyes off of their device because now they have to look around and read and they have to do reading which is really important number two what it does is now it makes them understand wow when i make errors it looks that silly right so it kind of drives home the point of man i need to be better right and then number three and again this is the critical thing now they're bringing work into your class it's not just something that they see in a, in a notebook. It's not just something there. They actually have a relationship with that content because they have found it. They discovered it. They took a picture of it. So to give you an example of this, next, next photo, please, Mitch. This is, um, or next slide. What's wrong with this photo? That's on actually a syllabus. 
that's actually on one of um, a, a syllabus that my students uh, found. And so these errors are all around us, right? And it says surface reflection. That should obviously be surface reflection. These errors are all around us. And I think it's critical that we try to make the best possible use of these as we move forward. Okay, so um, last couple things here. We obviously didn't get to a ton of things, but um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, if you could, Mitch, slide all the way down to slide 51. All right, so you can scroll through all the slides, all the way down to slide 51. And what I'd like everyone to do while he's doing that, in the chat box, please, jot down one thing that you learned today. Just one quick thing that you learned, one thing you thought about, um, an idea that you have based on something I said, something you're going to use in class. All right. So in the chat box, if everyone could uh, just go down and jot in one quick little thing there, that would be fantastic. All right. Great, Leslie. That's fantastic. I know that we've got people jotting them in there now. Yeah, photos are really critical. And, and there's just a thousand things we can do with them. Um, and and lot, a thousand things we can do, lots of things. I know Mitch is coming back up, and then we're going to finish up. No, so I just wanted to say that, you know, from room two, um, Antoinette Howard brought up the use of photos to show the understanding of a concept was something that, that she picked up. And Elizabeth said um, errors in the community. Community, um, to be able to have the students look for those and Patty Serrano said real-life applications using photos so those are some of the things that came out from uh, classroom two or from from room two thank you thank you for that so here's the other thing that I'm gonna say about photos before we wrap up um, and I got two minutes I'm probably gonna take four if you got to go I understand um, if you have your students take photos and videos throughout the year, if you have your students take photos and videos at the end of the year, you can have them create a year in review montage. Have them set it to music, and then what they will always have is a year in your class. And this can be really critical because it can be photos of themselves, photos of each other, photos of you. It can be the sad times, the hard lessons. It can be the funniest air in the community. It can be a lesson that you taught on biology that they really got because they had their own videos of it. So some of the most successful teachers that I work with and some of the things that I love what they do is they create these year in review videos. And then every student walks away with a year in my fourth grade class and third grade history class or a year in trigonometry. And these can be really, really powerful remnants and reminders for our students as they move on. Um, okay, Mitch, I've got about four more slides and then I'm just going to slide through and then we're done. I want to make sure to get the resources, if that's okay. So um, what you're going to see here um, on these next slides is, first of all, four tips. Remember that everything um, that we do can also be done outside of class. And this is critical because I know not everyone works in, in schools that have great internet or maybe the policies don't allow them to bring devices. Every student can take photos outside of class for example, that we got to today. Number two, you have to be willing to give up a control. We have to learn to trust our kids, right? This means taking advantage of everyone's funds of knowledge, but doing that means that you have to give them a chance to express that in different ways. And I think that this was one of my hardest things. I needed to be in control all the time, but it was amazing once I let that go, how much more learning happened in my class. Understand question, or the third thing, things will go wrong it will not work right and it will not always go smoothly right just be be comfortable being uncomfortable in class because there's going to be things that just okay, but it's how we react to that we just if we pop up and say well that didn't work let's try something else what we're actually teaching our students is resilience persistence but when we get frustrated it gives them silent permission to get frustrated and walk away when they're in math class and that's critical so it's all about how we react to these little failures that really matter. And then start small. Just do one thing, right? And I know some, a lot of you are using technology in class already, so I'm speaking to the choir. But try one new thing per week maybe, right, until you get fluent with that. And I think that's really critical. Okay, uh, last couple things here. Um, I was at a TEDx event, and they had this sign up, and I loved it. I wish every teacher had this at the start of their room. 
uh, at the start of the year, and this was something that they lived by. You may become incredibly inspired. Your mind may be blown away. Your heart might sing. What a brilliant way for us to think about our lessons. And hopefully all of our students are walking out of our classes with that happening the majority of the time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you go to church, you might know this. The preachers have a thing that they, they call, they say they preach themselves happy because they're talking about the gospel or whatever, and they get really into it, and they get happy teaching. We need to teach ourselves happy, right? I, um, as, as adults, we smile about 12 times a day. Our kids, we know, smile over 300 times a day. So as teachers, we're around these, these things that smile 300 times a day. We need to smile more. So let's teach ourselves happy, and I think that's critical. Okay, so for resources, uh, next slide, please. There are lots of resources um, here, including the slides. Uh, these are some of the, the teachers that I get a chance to work with, pre-service teachers. This is a great class of mine. Um, the slides there, the link is up top, and then there's also a QR code there. So if you want the slides, you can take a picture of that or, or get the QR code uh, and pop all the slides today. Again, probably 50% of the stuff I didn't even get to, right? But that's okay. We'll do it again next time. Um, Three, um, we're moving from that slide in five seconds, so get it quick. Okay, we're moving down. Um, here's a book um, that has a lot of the resources, thanks to the good people at Corwin. Um, we have a book that just came out, and there's a ton of resources in there. There's over probably 100 ways to use photos. There's, um, I want to say, at least 80 ways to use Twitter in the classroom. There's... Um, lots of different ways to do this. Um, Kara Rosenblatt and Don McMahon are authors of mine, and they're absolutely fantastic teachers in their own right. And so we have uh, lots of ideas and strategies. And then, honestly, most of the stuff that, that are, is in here is stuff that I just collected from really cool teachers um, around the world. So there's a link down there at the bottom. You can either get it um, from Amazon or from Corwin's site. Um, so there's a link there as well as the QR code, which will take you there. Um, three to one last um, thing here. Uh, no, I'm sorry, there's two more things. Uh, you can also check out the web, classbackpack.com. Lots of resources there every day. Um, my colleague Tracy and I put up a new uh, resource Monday through Friday, we take those off. But Monday through Friday, there's a new app, a new idea, a new strategy, something you can use in class. So you may be interested in that. And then I think there's one more resource that I'm providing for everybody. Yeah, so if you go to Edmodo, um, and if you're on Edmodo already, you, you know this deal. If you're not on Edmodo, um, if you go to Edmodo.com and you join as a teacher, and then you enter this group code, okay? So the group code is, is there at the top of the slide. If you enter this group code, what you will see is a bunch of folders that I have put in there for you. And what I have done, as you can see by the slide, is I've actually, I know it's a little unclear, but um, I've actually broken it into math resources, social studies resources, language arts resources, etc. So there's all kinds of tools in there. Now they're not strategies, which is what the book is really good for, because the book really goes in depth to strategies. But there are some tools there on Edmodo that you can check out. Um, again, the book is going to be much more comprehensive and much more strategies, but there are tools there anyway to help get you started. And Next slide, last thing here, Kareem. So I started with Kareem, I'm going to end with Kareem went ahead and got his master's degree. College, he now has a full-time job. Um, but here's the thing about Kareem. If I would not have allowed that him to use devices in class, he would have never made it. He would have never made it through school. He worked his butt off. He really did. He worked his tail off. But Kareem went ahead and graduated with a bachelor's degree and then with a master's degree and now has a full-time job. That's his, I don't know, fiance, girlfriend, somebody, right? Um, but he's out there and he's got a fully, a full life where he's contributing to society and he has a great life now. And that would not have happened without the use of devices. So I want to end with that. Um, and then Tom, who was on, said this next quote, every teacher has the right to live in a cave. However, they do not have the right to drag their students in with them. And I think um, this is something that we need to share with our colleagues. Again, you're here, you know about technology. You, you're, you're the experts already. We have to continually remind our colleagues to try to push themselves as well. So my contact information is up there. 
Um, please email me, tweet me, whatever. Um, website, uh, you can get to my personal website there, my email, and then my Twitter address is at Last Backpack. So uh, thank you so much. If you have questions, I'll stick around. You can put things in the, um, the chat box there, or you can just reach out to me in another way. But thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. If we, if we need to do another one, we certainly can. So I, in, in looking at all the tips that you had, I didn't see a tip on time management there. What happened to time management where um, you get through all of your slides? On what? I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't see any tips on time management there. I mean, I'm getting through all of your slides. Uh, yeah, clearly I'm uh, five minutes behind on time management. So, yeah, well, and 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 two thirds of your slides. So your, which what we're going to assess is that uh, we're going to bring you back in January. You're going to have to come back in January and, and uh, get through some more material. So, do you accept it? So I, I, I guess the uh, the nod is yes. A penalty. I like it. I like, see, I like that though. I, I you know what? I like being held accountable. So thank you for okay. that. <laughs> okay. No, th you know all, yeah. all well, you know what? Actually, yes, we would not have had so much interaction from Leslie. It probably would have helped us, but she just talked and talked and talked. So yeah, you know that yeah. just that happens sometimes, and uh, that's hard to deal with. Yeah, let's blame somebody who's not up here. Because I, you know, I wouldn't blame you, and you probably wouldn't blame me, right? What are you gonna do? Right. So, but but thank you. I, you thanks. know, this is great. You're uh, you're. But thanks uh, everyone for being here. Yeah. Uh, a lot of really good information. Um, I hope I hope that you do come back in January. Uh, we'll be in email, Twitter, in touch, um, a, a few times. And uh, for EdChat Interactive, uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I will. Uh, I'm gonna bring Definitely. you down. Okay, Zach. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, for EdChat in Interactive, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm going to be signing off in a second. Um, I would like to re register for next week on www.EdChat Interactive. I think we're going to have another really interesting talk on using uh, games with diverse classes. And everybody who comes will get a free lifetime uh, subscription to, um, to Schoolbow, uh, which, which, it, you know, the, it, which really has some phenomenal games. So uh, again, Mitch Weisberg saying good night for EdChat Interactive, uh, talking for Tom Whitby and Steve Anderson, and see you all soon, uh, hopefully next week. Uh, have a good night or good if you're in Singapore.